Our next speaker is uh, Edwin Park. He's a principal engineer at Qualcomm, and he received his master's degree from Rice University. Hello, I'm Edwin Park. I'm at Qualcomm AI Research. I work on ultra-low power, always on computer vision. I want to talk to you about what ultra-low power computer vision is, some of the use cases that come up with this always on, often battery powered uh, application, some of the approaches that we took to get to this very low power uh, computer vision, the product that we have, and some of the things we're looking for in the future. So let's first start. What is ultra low power always on computer vision? Our target was to have uh, this sensor at about one milliamp on a lithium ion battery. Uh, this is important because most sensors that are always on um, uses about this power. So you can think of uh, accelerometers for pedometers, um, audio for wakeboard detection, all use about one milliamp on a, on a battery. We also wanted low latency on the order of about one to 30 frames a second, depending on the use case. Uh, the information from this computer vision is what we wanted, not necessarily the image, uh, mainly because we're constrained on power. This is starkly different from a lot of the uh, computer vision and photography use cases. First of all, most image sensors itself takes on the order of 10 milliwatts to a watt, depending on a number of pixels and other uh, features on that sensor. The image processing, this could be the ISP, uh, color, distortion correction, and the computer vision itself could take on the order of hundreds of milliwatts to definitely more, more than watts uh, category. So here are some of the use cases that are available with ultra low power always on computer vision. And we could put this in uh, several buckets. First of all, we can look at buckets where the, uh, the sensor itself is moving. So think like a smartphone or a tablet where the sensor is moving uh, spatially over time. There are also use cases where the sensor is fixed. So you can think of IoT use cases, smart city, smart home type use cases. Also, you could um, think of sensors um, in two different categories. One is uh, where the ultra low power computer vision triggers another higher power, potentially higher fidelity sensor, often of a different modality to uh, continue the uh, sensing itself. The other use case is where this is potentially the only sensor in play uh, that either collects the data or triggers an event. So let's put concrete examples to this. Uh, let's say you have a smartphone. We could use this to detect the presence of your face, and when the face is detected, it enables an IR sensor for your iris or a face sensor to authenticate you to um, unlock the phone, all without touching the phone itself. On the other extreme, we could have an occupancy sensor in a room that when it detects the presence of a human being, turns on the light, um, and that's the only thing it does. Okay? So um, how do we do this? We have this. Uh, ultra low power system, which um, we use a third party sensor, a very low power sensor with uh, low power hardware with a lens on the module, so it's very easy for our customers to use. We designed this ultra low power uh, digital die, which has a low power MCU um, that does some of the algorithms and some of the uh, computer vision aspects of it. It's a hardware block that does most of the acceleration of the computer vision algorithms to keep the power low. And when the event occurs, we wake up a higher power processor to complete the event or to use another sensor uh, to uh, get more information. So this is some of the use cases that uh, we, uh, we, can, we could uh, facilitate. First of all, we detect a large class of objects. Our favorite class is humans. So we have a half body, a three quarter body, and a full body model. Um, and our hardware uh, fully accelerates that so we could keep this in a very low power envelope. Also, our hardware accelerates all the different orientations. You could think 90, 180, 270, to keep our models compact and the uh, uh, power and uh, time very low. And that's all accelerated in our hardware. Um, so we can run other algorithms with a conjunction of hardware and software, for example, change detect. We can look at a scene and see when changes occurred. And on those images, uh, process, further process the image, or on, the, uh, on that specific area, further process the image. And that's. Uh, done with a combination of hardware and software acceleration. We have other use cases where we could do simple, let's say, gestures, let's say simple left, right, left, or a box gesture that we could do with a combination of software and hardware acceleration. Uh, as I said earlier, we like detecting objects, so we could detect a lot of 2D markers and logos, and that's a crash test dummy pattern that we're showing uh, that we could detect. And also, we could detect a bunch of 3D rigid uh, bodies. So you can think of it as toys. And both of those models were rather easy to train, and they're quite compact, especially compared to a body or a face model. On the right side of the image, we're showing uh, a use case, and that's obviously not shot on glance, on, 
on the uh, sensor itself. Uh, on the top, we have, we're showing the, uh, uh, where the sensor is looking inwards to look at the shelf to see if the product is in stock, if the product is disheveled, or if another product is in front of the product of interest. In that uh, scenario, um, the grocer could come up and either clean up the shelf, put new product on the shelf, or remove the wrong product off the shelf. On the bottom side, uh, we have where we can see the presence of a person looking at the, the product. And it could, because of the size and the cost, we can look at the distinction between one product and another product, how long the person looked at the product, and collect all that information with uh, keeping privacy in mind of the consumer. All right, since oftentimes we're a fixed scenario, and you can see this image quality here, it's, it's monochrome, um, it's uh, lower resolution than most cell phone cameras, and, and especially because it's in IoT use cases, we often have to deal with very challenging lighting scenarios, and that's challenging on multiple fronts. First of all, it could be very dark. So on the upper right-hand corner, you can see face detection at sub three lux. At the bottom left-hand corner, you can see body detection at three lux. Uh, and once again, we can do all this uh, with uh, the sensor that we have. On the bottom right uh, corner, we see body detection in the presence of full sunlight. And this is actually the sun is in view of the camera. It's not off view of the camera, it's in view of the camera. And we uh, adjust it such that we could detect the body in that scenario. In the upper left hand corner, we're detecting a body. Uh, and so camera is posed such that it, the, full, the body is in fully bathed in the, uh, the ceiling lights of the, the shot. And we're still able to detect that body, and rather small body at 60 feet. Uh, so we have to train our model and work our algorithm such that it's resilient to all these scenarios. And that's very different than normal photography, where these scenarios just flat out uh, don't occur. Um, so our sensor is sensitive to A50. And this is important because it is, at the end of the day, a visible sensor. So in the presence of no light, we can't see anything, and we won't be able to detect. So in the, in the case of no light scenarios, we could use another uh, LED transmitter uh, emitter to trans, uh, emit the scene so we could see some objects and then be able to classify those objects. Once again, in those scenarios, uh, they'll be power dominated by the LED, not necessarily our detector. So how do we do this? Well, we, we take a different approach to solving this problem. First of all, the information is what's very important. The image itself is a secondary. And this is important because actually transmitting this image would dominate the power anyway. Uh, number two, um, many of these use cases, privacy is important. So not transmitting the image and computing everything on device has uh, advantages from a privacy point of view. And this is in very stark contrast to normal photography. In normal photography, the image quality is what's really important. So there's a big race to get to a higher number of pixels, uh, color, color depth is very important, uh, focus, autofocus, and uh, potentially synthetically defocusing like bokeh becomes very important to make the image quality look good. For us, we're in the other extreme. Uh, monochrome works in most cases. 8 bits is sufficient, and oftentimes less than 8 bits works fine. Focus is only as important as we need it to detect the object. Um, and pixels are important only as, uh, as we need to detect objects that are further away or smaller objects. Uh, everything else is like is more for just the image quality, um, which in our use case, we often uh, sacrifice for power. Uh, we look at the entire system power, not just the detection power. And this is in some contrast a lot of computer vision algorithms, which takes the image itself as a given uh, and then does a processing. We look at the entire system power, uh, the sensor and the algorithms itself. Uh, oftentimes, we shoot in very challenging uh, lighting scenarios. And this is, once again, in contrast to normal photography, where either the camera or the subject will be moved away from direct sunlight, or in very dark scenarios, a flash will be used. Those are two things that we just can't afford from a power uh, point of view. Uh, we, use, uh, we train our algorithms and our models to be very uh, inference friendly. So our training regime uh, from uh, inference and training is very lopsided in favor of inference. Uh, traditionally, a lot of that, uh, there's more balance between training and inference. Uh, our algorithms are always designed with memory and power in mind for the inference. Uh, another thing to uh, look at is our metrics are often event-based. And this is important uh, because we could trade off the frames per second uh, versus computation time uh, when we look at event-based metrics versus a single frame uh, metric. All right. We favor algorithms that are uh, adaptive compute. And what does that mean? Well, we favor algorithms that gets more complex as a scene gets more complex. Uh, likewise, um, these algorithms get less complex as the scene gets less complex. 
This is important because, especially in IoT type use cases, uh, most of the time, uh, not much is ha happening. So we could do, use our uh, simple algorithms to go first. We run our lighter weight algorithms first, and if that's sufficient, we terminate the pipeline there. Uh, we favor algorithms and models that are also uh, content adaptive compute. So as the um, detection looks more and more like a person, for example, let's say uh, a stick and then a tree, the amount of compute goes up versus, let's say, a blank piece of wall. And this is important, once again, because in most of our use cases, most of the scene is not that interesting, and we're able to save power on that. In some of our use cases, we're able to terminate our uh, computation early. And let, let me give you an example of this. Let's say we have an example where we have a higher power sensor that wants to wake up in the presence of uh, people, let's say in this room. After we detect one person, we could terminate the calculation and then let the higher power sensor continue. We don't have to continue calculating this, finding the second, third, fourth, and fifth person potentially at much higher power. Right. We try to simplify compute as much as possible. What does this mean? Well, traditionally in computer vision, you have one model and you run it against your image and then you downscale the image five or 10% to continue your detection at the different scales. Well, this downscaling of the image by five or 10% uh, is a lot more power than we could afford in our system. So what we do is we have multiple models to span the scale and we apply it to one image. And then we downsample the image 2x both horizontally and vertically and use the same model uh, to save power on the uh, scaling. Also, because we have a system focus in mind, uh, we favor brightness to favor detection. And this may not be as obvious because um, our images are typically darker and higher contrast and you and I would find it comfortable to look at the image. And this does help our detector. Uh, we optimize the entire system. So we use a low power sensor. We optimize the IO and we move algorithms as soon as possible to the hardware. And within that hardware, we put uh, memory as close to the possible to hardware. So multiple blocks could work in parallel at lower power and potentially higher compute. So the product we have is a Qualcomm QCC uh, 112. I think we have people on the product team here that you could talk to uh, if you're interested in this product. Uh, the product is commercialized. In many of the use cases, it supports a uh, power envelope about one milliwatt. And this is one milliwatt system power. It includes the sensor, the chip, the power management is all in. Uh, it features an ultra low power MCU. It in, uh, includes a streaming array processor, embedded power management, uh, the vision accelerator we, we talked about, and we're able to get to this um, very low power target by doing other things, circuit level innovations, including uh, custom memory, which gives us 2x lower um, uh, runtime power and 3x lower retention power uh, versus the standard memory cell that was in this library. The streaming array processor uh, supports uh, in the future a high, high level programming language capable of third party uh, neural networks. It's a wide in, uh, issue 32 bit data flow architecture. Uh, able to execute 16 instructions per second, has, uh, supports many different data types. Uh, it has the hardware support for loops, uh, address generators, and has the memory uh, near the processor so we can keep the, the MIPS versus the power uh, relatively high. And we also have a training tool, and please come to the poster and we can talk more about this in the interest of time, where customers could use uh, to train their own models to fit on, uh, on the hardware that we provide. In many ways, it's easier than writing code, uh, all you do is uh, have a bunch of positive images with the annotations, negative images, you can think of those as background. You feed it to this tool, it outputs a model. And if you have a, a test set, what we do is we could run uh, through the test set to find runtime parameters to optimize power and runtime versus the true positive and false positives that you require. Uh, it's actually pretty easy to use. And once again, come to the, the poster and we can talk more about that. Uh, in the future, what we can do is use this low power platform for a sensor hub. And you can think of this as we could put other sensors, for example, accelerometers, audio, all in this low power platform. We're always striving to lower the power of our current algorithms and our current capabilities that we have and bring in other algorithms, other model support uh, at slightly higher power. Uh, we're working with our sensor provider to provide a higher resolution sensor uh, that effectively gives us uh, ability to see at further distances, smaller objects, and potentially in a wider uh, field of view. And we're always striving to put in simultaneously more object classes that we could run in this lower power uh, envelope. And with that, we can take questions. Yes, we can take two questions. Maybe you can explain a little bit more on your event detection as the first step. 
Uh, so an event detection, let's say we want to detect Sorry, let's say, a presence of a question? Oh, so Let me ask you the question again. Yeah. He wants uh, me to explain more on the event detection. So uh, tell me if I got the question right um, with this answer. So let's take a simple example of a face detection to trigger something else. Um, we're, so we're always looking for a face. And in our uh, primer set, you could say spe specify a face here, a, a face of a certain size. So it only triggers on those events. And when though that event occurs, we could wake up a higher power processor, potentially another sensor, another part of the system, to either authenticate you or to uh, provide the right action. Does that answer your question? Okay. Next question here. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I may have missed it, but can you break down the power a little bit for us? How much in the sensor? How much in the uh, the inference engine, how much in the rest of the kind of infrastructure? That's a good question. So once again, depending on the application, it could be on the order of one milliamp, uh, one milliwatt, depending on your application. Um, so depending on the use case, indoors or outdoors, uh, because outdoors is much brighter and the sensor exposure time is less than very, a very dark scene. So if you look at a, um, a portfolio of lighting examples and portfolio of uh, Detection use cases, it's about 50 50 from the sensor and the digital. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much. In the interest thank of time, we'll move on.